All right. So um, hello, everyone, and um, welcome to our 198th Friday Hacks, um, and the first Friday Hack for the semester and the year. Uh, I'm Mayank, and together with Chingen, we'll be hosting Friday Hacks for you this semester. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, let me give you an introduction to what Friday Hacks is about. So it's an event where we get to where we get people to come share their hacks, research, or technical knowledge uh, with the community in NUS and Singapore. Um, this semester, we'll be hosting speakers from every part of the CS field. So we'll have professors and academics working on logical programming, um, software engineers. Uh, we'll have the creator of the Ruby language coming in. Um, we'll have entrepreneurs who pitch it at, at, at Y Combinator uh, later in the semester. And uh, while we have a wide variety of speakers, um, the unifying theme of our talk is, of course, um, spreading the hacker spirit and uh, encouraging people to share any cool ideas they've come up with. Um, so yeah, without further ado, ado uh, we'll be beginning um, with two of our talks um, today. Um, the first one is called um, How Fluminers Was Built, um, and it's by Julius. Uh, and the second one will be uh, URA's project, uh, Space Out Project, which we'll have at eight o'clock after a short break in between. Um, and uh, just to give you a bit of introduction for the first talk. So it's about how Fluminous was built. Um, and Fluminous is a CLI tool, which sort of um, abstracts away um, uh, an unattracted platform called Luminous, which is used by all NUS students. And the talk is, our, our speaker for today is Julius, who is a recent alumni of NUS and uh, an NUS Hacker Score team member. And he's interested in um, programming languages, uh, distributed systems, uh, space exploration, history, music theory, um, and the Kerbal Space Program. So yeah, um, Julius, uh, go have at it. All right, thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully this doesn't, this doesn't break again. Ta-da. Yeah, okay. Does it work? Yeah, it's working great. Okay, cool. Yeah, hi. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, but, 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 let me just put this. Okay, yep. Uh, so hi, yeah. So uh, hi, I'm Julius. So uh, thanks for the brief introduction, Mayank. Uh, and yeah, I just recently graduated. So uh, last semester was my last semester. And yeah, so uh, actually what I did when I was in, when I was still a student was actually, I wrote this CLI tool called Fluminous. And later on, I also uh, ported it to Rust so that people on Windows can also run it as well. Cause uh, my earlier tool can only be run on, on Linux and Macs basically. So uh, the idea is that downloading files one by one from like NUS system is really slow. So we have this website called Luminous, which is uh, a learning management system. So lecturers would actually upload their videos. Uh, and if you have uh, like files for the module, so for example, like lecture slides and what, whatever things, they will upload it to the same, uh, to, 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 to the to the website. So the idea is that like we want to automate this thing and we have some kind of rudimentary synchronization. So we only want to download new files and we don't want to uh, keep on downloading the same old files again so that uh, it won't be too slow. So in uh, the version that I actually uh, uh, hacked a lot on is actually uh, Fluminous, which is the earlier one written in Elixir. And I actually wrote a bunch of other things like downloading webcasts, multimedia files and other things. And later on, I actually ported it to Rust, uh, like again, to, to run, to be able to run it on Windows. Uh, right now, I can't find anybody to maintain Fluminous because it's written Elixir, it's kind of a niche language, I guess. But Fluminous is actually active and we have uh, three new maintainers now. So if you're interested, you can always like uh, head up there and like contribute. So I think recently they just merged in like fun a new functionality to download multimedia files. So that's great. And yeah, I guess the, the idea here is like, I want to show you uh, why, the, the why of uh, Fluminous, I guess. So uh, in the time long, like long, long ago before there was Luminous, actually NUS used this thing called IBLE. So it was actually like a typical server rendered website. So uh, it has a backend that just like spits you HTML pages instead of like the, the current spa, like, you know, JavaScript based uh, single page application that is Luminous. Uh, so this is how I really look like. So uh, I, I think some of you from NUS might have not been admitted yet when I really was still around, but like, you know, it was decent, it works. 
And most importantly is that IVLE actually allowed anyone who can log into IVLE to get an API key. So this kind of like, you know, in the long time ago, like, you know, uh, back in the time when APIs are very open. So for example, like Twitter has their own API, Facebook has their own API. You can, you, you don't have to actually like, you know, scrape HTML pages. You can like get an API key, then people can uh, log in to Twitter, for example, uh, for your app so that your app can get a token that you can then use to like, access various things. So I think this is mostly used for like third party Twitter uh, clients, but I really actually has that as well, which is like really, really awesome. So uh, people from SOC School of Computing has actually used this API to build a lot of like very, very uh, like complex things on top of the API. So for example, there was a project that would try to sync your files from IVLE uh, up to like some cloud provider. So you, you want to sync it with like Dropbox or Google Drive. And I made some Telegram bots for announcements. So I keep on missing announcements and I, I just made a bot that would like check IVLE periodically. And then whenever it finds a new announcement, it would just like send a message to you. And some websites also use it for authentication. So uh, for example, like uh, School of Computing's uh, introductory programming actually uses IVLE as a way to make sure that the student is taking uh, CS 101S, uh, like, which is the, the module. Uh, the reason why I can easily build the same thing on Luminous is that Luminous actually keeps on delaying their public release. So uh, initially they said that they're gonna release it on March, 2018. And then after that, they move it back to April to August. And eventually they just say like, oh, we'll release it whenever we release it. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, there was a developer portal that I found out some way or another, but unfortunately I'm not, I, I still couldn't use the, like the developer portal because uh, there's a process there, which is fully manual to request for an API key. But uh, this is like actually a regression because back then for IVLE, all you need to do is you just need to log in and then you can get your API key straight away. There's no like manual process involved. Whereas right now you have to actually like request that and then you need someone to approve it. And actually my request on API key has never been granted. So there's that. Plus I actually checked the uh, terms and conditions attached to the API key. Actually, you can only make something like 30 calls per, per week or something like that. So it was like uh, something that's like totally not enough for most purposes. It's like a, it's like a test key. So uh, that's kind of a no-go. So my solution to this was just to like reverse engineer the, the Angular front end of Luminous. So what I'm going to do to be able to interface with Luminous is just to see how the SPA front end, like the one written in JavaScript, how, how they request things from a backend and then just make my program perform the exact same thing so that to the backend, my behavior is exactly the same as how the Luminous front end would actually do it. And uh, this is the interesting part, which is like uh, when you need to reverse engineer Luminous, when you uh, like, uh, and the tool that I used was actually like something that's built in in most browsers, which is the developer console. So I'm not sure whether y'all have uh, used this before. It's actually very interesting. So you can even like make your own fake news just by like editing things. Cause, uh, I, or, and like, if you're building a website, you would also sometimes use this to check and make sure that like, uh, for example, your page is making the correct requests or whether like, uh, things are rendered correctly and if they're not you can like use this to find out easily and the part that I'm interested most in is this tab called network so here I'm using Firefox but you you can easily like uh, get this feature some other way in in Chrome and even Safari although like you have to go through a long step of things but yeah so you can see here like this is like me loading the Luminous uh, website and what I want to see is the first part is the login flow because if you haven't logged in you can't do anything, right? And that part is actually a bit problematic because NUS has a single sign-on system. So it's an SSO system where uh, every single NUS website that has to uh, authenticate a student, everyone will actually uh, redirect you to this same website. You log in there and then they would lock you, then they will redirect you back uh, into the original website saying that, oh yeah, like you are indeed truly an NUS student. And this process, can be a bit difficult to capture in this network tab because usually every time you get redirected away to a new page, then 
uh, this whole thing would clear and you can't you can't see what what's what's gone like after you get redirected so actually there's this very nice functionality called persist locks so uh, in firefox this way it's located it's also it also exists in some form in in chrome like i've used it before and this is what happens after i click so like from here if i click any as user login what happens is that it's going to redirect me to the single sign-on system which is this page and here what i want to see what i will uh zoom in on is actually this part on the right which is like inspecting a request so this is like what happens when you click on the NUS user login. So you can see that actually you have this get request uh, with like this parameter. So there's response type, client ID, state, redirect URI, scope, resource, and all, all those things. And you can see like the response headers, you can see the request headers, you can even see like the timing and stuff. So it's a very useful thing, especially when you are trying to reverse engineer. So you, oh, what you can see here actually is actually an OAuth 2.0 authorization request. So uh, if you're familiar, OAuth 2 is actually what most apps would use. So when you say like sign in with Google or sign in with, with Facebook, um, most of those websites are using this protocol called OAuth 2.0. And that's exactly what NUS is also using uh, for most of the websites. So for Luminous, uh, when they uh, redirect you to the SSO website, they're actually doing an OAuth 2.0 flow where they, give some uh, of this thing. So for example, response type code, which means that they, 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 they want the code flow. They have the client ID, which is specific to Luminous and they have the redirect URI, which is like some Luminous URL. Uh, and the other stuff, we can just ignore it for now. And another interesting feature that you can use to actually inspect this kind of things is when you right click on a request, you can do copy as curl. I think this also exists on Chrome. So uh, for those of you who don't know what curl is, curl is kind of like, uh, it's a CLI tool that you use in your shell to download things and like do like some quick, uh, hold on, let me see if I can open a terminal uh, there. Uh, okay, hopefully this is big enough, but uh, yeah, but uh, basically if you say like you call google.com, what happens is that it will actually make a HTTP request to Google and it would just like print you the result. And you can even do other things. I can do like curl dash V and it will give you more details about like what requests they're using and stuff like that. So uh, in the case of Luminous, so say for example, I open the network tab and then say I just refresh the page. Yeah. So I, I, get, I get this thing, right? I get, you probably can't see it, it's a bit small. Uh, yeah. So these things, uh, and what I can do is I can actually go and right click on it and I can do copy as curl. So when I go to the shell and I paste it and I press enter, it does exactly uh, like, it basically does exactly how the browser uh, requested the thing from the website. So it includes like the cookies, it includes the special headers that was used and everything. So it's very useful for debugging and you can also use it to figure out the minimum parameter required. So uh, once I pasted this, you can see that actually there's a cookie. So for example, you want to find out which cookie was actually used for them to authorize you. You can like delete them one by one and just kind of like, uh, like kind of like do a binary search or even a linear search like on like uh, how this is done and like what is required and what is not required. And all of this is because they won't release like an, like, like, like an open API for people to use. Uh, yeah, so the next part, is inspecting a post request. So uh, say you get this form, after you fill this in a click sign in, this is actually a form. And what happens is that it will make a post request containing your username and password. So let's see what happens there. So you can see here that actually it's the exact same, uh, the exact same URL, except that you're doing a post request. And you can see that it results in a HTTP 302, which would redirect you to another location. And, and see, I would have missed this if I didn't enable persist lock just now, but because I enabled it, this is not gone and this is like kept around. And you can see like the location that it's gonna redirect you to. And the server is also setting some cookie. Uh, the more interesting part is if you go to the request part of it, you can see like, I mean, I, for obvious reasons, I remove my username and password, but you can see like, like these three things are what you need to pass in the body uh, for this post request. And then if we follow on like from this, uh, 
post request to the location that we are redirect being redirected to. Uh, we got this get uh like get request which uh hold on sorry yeah so we we are, we we're going to get this get request so like uh uh this get request is is where we are being redirected with the HTTP three zero two and we got here and what happens is that it's giving us it's basically re redirecting us back to Luminous. So remember just now Luminous actually giving uh, some redirect URI uh, to the single sign-on system, which is like this URL. And what happens is that after the single sign-on system recognizes you and it authenticates you, it will redirect you back to the redirect URI, but it will pass on some uh, parameters that is that, that, that can show that like, oh yes, we have authenticated you, which is this code and this state, uh, it just stays not really important. It is is for some security thing. But the most important part is the code. So what happens next is we are back in Luminous with a callback URL. So this is the OAuth 2.0 token given by the SSO system. So what happens next? We see this like flurry of requests. So the first one is where we are being redirected. The rest we have like some JavaScript, some uh you know five icon. And the most important part here is the ADFS token. Like that looks interesting because it says token, right? The rest is like finding out your profile, your current, I assume like current module or something like that, right? So let's look at the ADFS token. It's actually a get request. So it's a post, okay, so it's a post request with this uh, data that you pass on. So you notice that the code you got just now uh, from the single sign-on system is actually being passed on to this uh, endpoint ADFS token. Uh, and the response from the server is actually this access token that is valid for one day, right? Uh, and this thing is actually a JWT, which is then used as uh, part of the bearer request header that you uh, used in the API. So from there, you can just store this thing and this is valid for one day and you can use the API from there, which is uh, like, and th this is how you would do it. So uh, I probably can't show the login flow because like there's a lot of sensitive data uh, li life, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's roughly how how you would reverse engineer a system. And after that, you just basically keep on doing the same thing for like the different API endpoints. So say you want to get a module, then you find out like you try to uh, go to the my modules page, right? So after you log in, you're actually on, on this page, you're in the dashboard, right? So from here, if you go to my modules, you can see that it would like make a request to get your modules, right? which is like either this or this, I think it's this one or this one. I'm not sure, I, either one, right? Uh, and then from there, you can just see like, oh, what is the response? Then you can see, oh, it's a JSON and like it has uh, whatever thing inside, right? And from here, you can even see like the header request and you can see like the cookies and whatever. And if you go to the uh, authorization, you can see like, oh, the bearer, blah, blah. I'm not, I'm not showing it because like, I'm locked into it right now. So there's like a valid uh, access token. Uh, so how I would do it is I would usually copy the request as curl and then I would try to uh, run it in, 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 in the shell and see if I can uh, reproduce it every single time. So I can do this, rep I can replicate each of the steps that the browser does in curl. And then after I am able to reproduce it uh, every single time then I would actually like script it up in your favorite programming language. So I first did it in Elixir and I did it in, 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 in Rust. Uh, however, actually, if you just do this, right, if you try to use curl and you do the last step of exchanging the, the, the OAuth token, it will actually fail. And it turns out that Luminous actually expects some kind of special HTTP request headers. So if we go back to the ADFS token and we look at the request headers, you notice that actually there's this like two non-standard request headers, OCP, API, and subscription key. So I suspect it's like some Azure thing because uh, Luminous is hosted on Azure, like Microsoft Azure. So, uh, but basically this is where curl is useful because when you copy as curl, then you try to remove the request headers and stuff and you see that like, oh, it doesn't work with that, that it, but it works with this and you know like which headers you actually need. So uh, if you just copy paste straight away from uh, like copy as curl, 
and you write in your shell, that would work. But if you try to form your curl manually with like no headers whatsoever, then uh, this OCP APIM subscription key uh, header wouldn't exist and your request would just fail. And then if you add that and it would work. So like it's, curl is actually very useful to like uh, debug things. Uh, you can do it in your in your in your favorite languages REPL, of course. But uh, say if you're doing it in Rust, right? Then Rust doesn't really have a REPL. So this is like doing it by call is very very useful to debug all these kind of things. So uh, I'm just gonna show you like the relevant code in Elixir simply because the Elixir Elixir is a higher uh, like it's a higher programming language than Rust, so things are more readable. So we can see here that at first. Uh, I'm just let me stop you there. Um, I don't think we can see the slides. So. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Let me let me try stop sharing. So weird. Oh no! Does that happen again? Uh, yep. I think it happens again. Okay. Let me. Okay. Let me rejoin in a bit. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. So yeah, I think so far it's uh, it's rather interesting that um, Luminous has a very uh, long-winded API to log in. Um, so for those of you who haven't used it, um, Luminous is the the official portal that NUS uses for students to um, uh, log in, access files, access the modules, and so on and so forth. But yeah, yeah, uh, Julius is back, so yeah. Hey, okay, sorry. Uh, well, how 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 far back was I? Um, the last thing I think we've seen was the ASDF token, so ADSF token. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah this part, right. Uh -huh. Right, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so you can see the response is this ADFS token, which gives, uh, which basically ex you exchange the code that you got from the single sign on with uh, this access token, which is like the JWT, uh, which you should pass in as your as part of the bearer request header and expires in one day. Uh, so that's basically the login flow. So you obtain an OAuth token from a single sign-on server. After that, you exchange this with a JWT access token. Uh, so, sorry. So the next part I was talking about, like you can replicate these steps using call or, and then after, after you can replicate everything, like you can reproduce what happens every single time. You can just go to your favorite programming language and then you can uh, just script it basically automate the thing. And unfortunately, if you do the last part of exchanging SSO OAuth token, uh, through a request, let's say you make using your favorite programming language and you like form the request from scratch instead of like doing like copy as curl from the browser, then it would actually fail. And the reason for this is because Luminous backend actually expects some kind of special HTTP request header. So if I go to the browser and I look at the request headers, uh, if you look at this, like there's a lot of like just standard request header, but you will notice that there's these two OCP APIM subscription key and OCP APIM trace that is actually non-standard. And these are actually what the backend expects. Like, I'm not so sure. I think it could be part that like the backend is hosted on, on, on Microsoft Azure and it could be that this is some Azure thing. But uh, what is very useful is you can like right click on the request, you can copy as curl. And then after that, when you get the curl command, you can just easily like remove some headers and you try to see what's the minimum like successful request and from there you can figure out like uh which which header is actually needed and which part is actually like superfluous and it's not needed so th th that's a nice part about like using curl for this i mean you can use your your language as well and just add or remove but like there's no like right click copy as like your favorite language so uh curl is very useful in this regard so uh, I'm just showing like the relevant code in Elixir. So I'm using Elixir instead of Rust because Elixir is very high level. So uh, it's much more readable than if I show you the Rust code for this. So uh, the first part is just the query, which is like uh, for the get parameter. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, for the query, uh, which is like the response type, client ID, redirect URI and resource. So this part is just hard coded actually uh, and you notice that I don't include state, I don't include nonce, and because those things, those two things are actually optional in the OAuth2 uh, RFC, and actually I try and it works. So I, I guess the Luminous backends backend uses some library that follows OAuth2 faithfully. 
And then as for the body, I encode this query. So username, password, and the auth method is forms authentication. So exactly following whatever happens just now when the browser does it. And then I basically form the URI string uh, from this query string. And then, uh, well, Elixir is very, very, uh, it's very, okay, let me just zoom in so that y'all can see better. It, it's very declarative in, in a way because it's the functional programming language and I can use, uh, I can use pattern matching. So what happens is I try to post the given URI in body and I expect to get uh, 302 to a location that I then get and I should get another 302. And the new location is actually uh, what you get when you get the callback to Luminous. So from there, I would like pass this uh, like Luminous callback and I would decode it and get a code. And then what happens is I would try to form this uh, new query that I would send to the ADFS token. Like you can notice here, uh, what happens afterwards, I post to ADFS token and the body is actually this thing, which is like I, uh, whatever you saw just now form into this and note that I actually include the OCP APIM subscription key because because otherwise without this, the request would fail. And then once I get back, I would decode the JSON and from there I get access token. And that's what you need to, in order to like log in into uh, Luminous. So uh, it's, well, thankfully it's a pretty standard OAuth uh, like strategy, but uh, you know, OAuth can be very, very weird. Like for example, like we're kind of lucky that they don't have like any uh, CSRF uh, token because otherwise we have to like do worse things and like uh, interpret HTML or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> thankfully they don't. And then the more interesting, the like, and then after that, it just you just do the same thing. So I'm just gonna show like one part where I try to inspect an API request. So uh, for example, this is actually for me to uh, look for the modules, I think. Yeah, I think that's it. So uh, there's this like thing. So the request header is pretty standard. You just use like the, you just give authorization bearer from like the access token that you got from, from, from ADFS token. But otherwise, it's pretty standard. You just use like it's, it's a typical GET request. Uh, and then as a response. Uh, sorry, you uh, are you on the next slide? Yes. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's frozen again. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to rejoin really quick. Sure, yeah. Uh, this is very, very annoying. Okay, it's back, yeah, right. It's back. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm just gonna show you like very quickly how I would do it for an API request. So uh, we can see here that like, it's a pretty standard uh, like request header. Uh, we just pass on the authorization bearer and we pass on like the access token that we uh, got just now from the ADFS token endpoint. And otherwise it's just a pretty standard get request. You just have to like figure out uh, what is the possible uh, like parameters. And after that, uh, after you do that correctly, you should be able to get like this JSON response. So you get like uh, the data that you want. So in my case, like say I have like PC1431 and that's basically like what I have here showed. So you just kind of like uh, sync up between like what action you do in Luminous and what, what requests are being made and you see the response from the backend and what is being showed up. And that's how in general I would do it. So again, I would just show you like the relevant code in Elixir. So, uh, you know, good software engineering practice is to like create the appropriate abstraction. So I think it's a pretty nice abstraction to uh, have like a function called API. So what happens is, okay, actually this is not needed, I think, but it was needed. I'm not sure. So like, yeah, I think for safe. Yeah, so what happens here is I would try to form the header, which is like, I pass in the JWT that we got as the authorization and then, uh, the OCP API subscription key. So I'm not sure whether this needed anymore, but I think it's there just for good measure. And the content type must be application JSON as opposed to uh, like form URL encoded. And then uh, using the path that is given, I form the full URI and from there I just request. And then if I can get the body, I would just like decode it and return it. Otherwise like I can either get a uh, HTTP 401 for like if the token is expired or if the response is not what I expect, I would just like throw an error basically. So how I would use this is I would use slash module. So you note that here, 
Uh, oh no. That, oh, uh, it froze up again, I think. Oh yeah, it did. Yeah, let me try sharing again. Does that work? Oh, it doesn't, yeah. I think you need to join back again. Uh, uh, would you like to send send your slides to one of us? Maybe we can sure. press the next button for you or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's probably better. All right. right. Sorry for this. No worries, no worries. Okay. Uh, yep. It's in the group. All right, yeah, I'll share screen for now. Yep, is it visible? Oh, uh, yep, okay. Great. Yeah, let All me right. just move to your, uh, your slide. Sure. I guess this is where we start. Right. Uh, was it here? Okay. Yeah, right. So yeah, so I, I just formed like a, a, a basic uh, abstraction around it. So I just I, I just give like the authorization bearer, uh, the access token. I put the OCP APIM uh, just for good measure and the content type-based application JSON. And basically if I get status code 200, then uh, I get a body, then that's like uh, what you need. That's what you want. And next slide. Uh, that's exactly like uh, the function for when you want to get the modules. So uh, as you saw just now, it's the slash module uh, endpoint. And then from there, I would just like process the data that I got because uh, with this abstraction, I don't even have to care that it's a JSON or how I should form the request. I just get back like uh, the JSON data decoded. And then from there, I just process and do whatever is necessary. Uh, yeah, so okay, next slide. Yep. So. Uh, just as a call to action, like if you want to contribute to Fluminous, like please do so. Uh, this is like the website, so it's just github.com slash Fluminous slash Fluminous. It's written in Rust, so if you want to get familiar, you want to learn Rust, you want to uh, like actually get better at Rust, it's, contributing is a very good way to do it. We have three maintainers right now, uh, Huawei, Tingyan, and Bernard. So uh, Huawei and Tingyan are part of NS Hackers. So anyway, like feel free to hit them up. If you want to contribute, like there are some issues in the repo. So if you want, if you're interested to take up some issue, just like go there and like uh, take up one of them. And yeah, uh, that's the answer. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you very much. So like, I'll just open it if anyone has any like questions about anything. Sure. So yeah, y'all can put a question in the chat or you can just ask them out loud. I think uh, you already have one uh, in the chat. Let me read it out for everyone. So Tyron says, um, hey, Julius, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, do you have any book to recommend to read up on to get more understanding of APIs and curl, uh, which is network programming, API programming, and so on? Mm, I wouldn't say this is like very network programming because like it's not very low level. Like you, you only operate on the level of HTTP protocol, which if you look at the network stack, it's actually pretty high up. Uh, I guess for curl, you can just read the manual. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds very like, very cliche, but uh, I guess I learned curl mostly from like, well, you can always search Google and like, you know, how to how do I do X on curl? Uh, for APIs, I'm not so sure. You can, you can read up like RESTful API. Uh, and like, I think if you go to Google, you should be able to see like this kind of things. Uh, I think, um, but like but most of those things will probably do with like how you design API instead of like how you would reverse engineer an API, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, I don't really read like any single book. I just like get my uh, info from my various sources, like read the manual, just find questions on Stack Overflow and things like that. Right, right. Um, yeah, actually um, I had a question, right? Um, is there any particular incident that made you write Fluminous? Like, is there some frustration you had with Luminous that oh. made you write Fluminous? Uh, it's just, it's just kind of like my flow, uh, like with IVLE because they have the API. So a lot of people have actually written like things similar to Fluminous uh, and just, I just use it, which is really nice. You know, I just go to my, I just go to my shell, run the script and then I can see like what new files are being downloaded and I can look at them. And I just want to like do the same flow. So I'm like, Hey, you know what? Let, let's do it. 
Hmm. Like, let's do the exact same thing. Right. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there's another question, right, uh, by Jenny. Uh, she asks, uh, she says, uh, thanks, for the very, thanks for the very interesting sharing. Um, I use Fluminous a lot to sync up my modules files. Uh, if I want to do something similar for cosmology, say F cosmology or something, <laughs> um, how does Celestia begin uh, to try to fetch all the files, etc.? And uh, could you tell, let us know um, what the F in, in, in Fluminous stands for as well? Well, I, I think it's not politically correct to say what the F is. Uh, you all know what the F is because I was so frustrated with like Luminous not doing this public API and like a lot of the UX got really, really worse. But I think cosmology is a different thing because cosmology is actually more similar to the IBLE as compared to Luminous. So it doesn't have like a separate backend. As far as I know, cosmology is like a Rails app. So uh, the server would like uh, do whatever you want to do and then it would like spit out a HTML page. So I think what you want to do here is to like uh, find out how they do things and then you but okay the bad thing here is that you need to pass the pass the html and that's probably uh not 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 the best because you don't get like a uh, structured data like json so unfortunately that's probably what you have to do i i, I don't think cosmology has like a particular api uh, that is like restful uh yeah, yeah and Someone else asked, could you explain what the bug was from two weeks ago, the one with the SS... Okay, it's not SSH, it's SSL issue. So what happens is Luminous... Okay, so we have HTTP secure, right? Which is uh, based on public key infrastructure. So we have certificates to make sure that the server is who they say they are. And uh, for that, they need to have certificates. And in order to make sure that the certificates are secure, they are actually renewed every so often. So, the certificate of Luminous actually expired on New Year, somewhere around there. So they have to replace it with a new certificate. But what happens is that when they replace it with a new certificate, they, okay, so this kind of, this is kind of complicated, but the, what happens is that we have this thing called CA, Certificate Authority, I think. So uh, these certificate authorities are who issues the certificates. So these are like trusted bodies that, will make sure that uh, the server is owned by whoever they say they are, and then they will issue certificates to them. And how this happens is you use this certificate to sign other certificates so that the as long as you can trace back from one certificate all the way down to the CA, then that certificate is good. So what happens in Luminous's case is that there are actually three certificates that is needed to get down to the CA. So you have Luminous itself, you have an intermediary, and you have the CA route. So what happens is that for most websites, all three certificates are actually deliver, like sent send down to the client so that they can, as, as long as they can see that the CA route uh, signs the chain of certificates, then this is good. But what happens with IBLE is that they only send the final certificate. So if the client doesn't know about the intermediate certificates, then they can't establish this chain of trust uh, all the way from CA route to the Luminous certificate. And that's what happens. Like the browsers are fine because browsers have the intermediate certificates built in. So they have, they, they will use this Luminous certificate and they will also take into account like all the intermediate certificates that they have and they can establish the like chain of trust. But if you use curl, for example, and they can't or like uh, other CLI tools. Right, right, right. So it's like a certificate mismatch with Luminous. Mm -hmm. Something like that, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think another question that uh, we had was, um, uh, what made you pick Elixir to choose Luminous to code uh, Fluminous initially? Oh, like, why it, it, it was just the language I was most comfortable in. Like it has a REPL, I can easily change things. I can hack things around. Like uh, it's much faster than if I do it, say with like Rust. Like the nice thing about Rust is that it's multi-platform. I can write it once and, well, not really once, but I can write it and it would run on Windows and Linux alike. Uh, but uh, Elixir, I mean, I, I do it mostly for myself, so it doesn't run on Windows because I don't use Windows. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Elixir was kind of nice for me. Like, I can write things with very short code. That, that's the whole reason. Right, right. Um, hmm. I think, uh, yeah, another question we had was, um, so we were going through your uh, uh, Fluminous um, GitHub readme, right? And you mm -hmm. mentioned um, that Luminous is rather slow um, and it's infamous mm -hmm. for, for slow speed, right? So we're curious um, because in the software engineering industry, right? They say that it's uh -huh. more important to know what to not do uh, than to what to actually do, right? So uh -huh. uh, is there any uh, bad coding practice you could find in Luminous 
or some O and uh, then we found out that really frustrated you a lot. At the very least, when I when I look at like what the back end is, uh, sorry, at what the front end is doing. For well, for example, like a bad practice is that luminous. Uh, like JS, uh, JS files are actually not minified. So if you go into uh, like Luminous and you look at the JavaScript source code, you can look at all the to-do comments. Actually, like you can do that. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you can see like to-do, uh, like handle the 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 expired to- of token, which I guess is why you see those like like uh like extend session or something like that. Yeah. Which is not good because like it will slow down the time taken to download them. Because yeah, right, right. Uh, That's mm-hmm. interesting. Um, yeah. Does the audience have any other questions? All right. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, "Why not Java? It runs on three billion <laughs> devices." Like, I, I, I hope it's a joke, but if it's not, <laughs> yeah, why not Java? Uh, I have a particular hatred of Java. It's just very verbose. Like the thing about about Elixir is that like it's very concise. I like, can see just now that like with whatever how many lines like, I can express things very concisely. Uh, yeah, you can do functional programming in Java, but that's like bolted on. I mean, modern Java isn't too bad. Like I recently built a compiler on Java fourteen, which wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. But like, uh. Yeah, otherwise like, I wouldn't recommend writing scripts in Java. Like Python is fine. Like someone ported Luminous to Python. Like and the thing that's nice about Alexa is that it is very like, you know, it's kind of like, why would you write this in Python and not C, for example? Like, it just things like that. Julius, I have a question. Uh, do you mind mm-hmm. if I share my screen? Sure. Yeah. So uh this is a This is Windows. Yes, this is Windows. Okay, yeah. So, uh, we didn't get to show a demo of Luminous earlier, right? So uh, yeah, we didn't. This is kind of Luminous. Mm-hmm. Right, and clearly it's a command line app, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I could add a download flag or whatever. Sure. Uh, I'm not gonna do that now. But my question is, do you think there's a, do you think there's the demand for a GUI version of this for people who are not so familiar with the command line interface. Yeah, actually, there's been there's been quite a few like uh, demand for it. I think, uh, for the Python version, actually, like uh, someone built a GUI for it, like which is really nice for people who's not from computing, right? Like they're not used to the CLI, but I just didn't have the time to build it, so I didn't. I mean, mostly it's just like things that I built for myself. I want like to share it with the with, with others, which is why I made it open source, and like you know, people can just use it. But yeah, I mean. If you're interested in making a joy for it, like go for it. Like Fluminars is open source <laughs> and it's up there on GitHub. Yeah, okay. I guess someone will have to take it up. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess the last question we had for you um, was uh, even though you're not maintaining uh, Fluminous as actively anymore, what do you think is the next step for, for Fluminous? Do you see any big thing or any features you want to add to it? Uh, I mean, I I probably won't be touching it anymore because like, well, we found like, oh, hi, Ting Yan, yeah, one of the maintenance, right? Uh, yeah, for, for, for the Rust version, the Elixir version, I'll probably just archive it and just like, you know, uh, tell people to use the Rust version. And uh, I think there's quite a lot of active development. So for example, I think there's some like features that exist in the Elixir version that doesn't exist on the Rust version. So uh, like, for example, like, I think the Rust version still can't download webcasts. I'm not sure. Sure, I think the multimedia file downloading has just been added. So there's a couple of features that they are not at parity yet. So I guess like there will be one that you want to do. I think another thing that uh like uh the maintainers are discussing as well is filtering files. So for example, if you're TAing a mod, you may not want to download the folder. Or for example, even if you download the folder, you might not want to want certain files. Or for example, like if the uh if the file like sometimes module coordinators like to re-upload the same file again like maybe they want to do some i think right now fluminous has the detection somewhere where they will like read a lot of file if it's newer something like that uh, i think it's just like kind of like either more features of like you know downloading more things from luminous or just like kind of conveniences right yeah that makes sense um uh, do you think it's going to be harder to add features in rust as you move down the road or uh, do you think it's a good platform to build on uh well it's 
it's all right, I guess. I mean, it doesn't have a REPL, but like you can always hack around in curl first and then just like uh, write it in Rust once it's ready. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And as uh, our commentator said, uh, Chingen uh, should keep it in good hands. So yeah, I think uh, with that, we can come to the close of um, our first half for the day. Um, I guess we'll take um, a 10 minute break. So we'll reconvene at um, 7.55. Um, with a second talk by uh, Ms. Jazreel from URA. Thanks, Julius. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, hi, Jazreel. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to try like testing your setup now so we can avoid what happened with Julius earlier? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, sure. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, I think you're mute, but uh, I can see that you say yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that the app itself or the slide? The slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I can move. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll be starting the next talk at 7.55, I guess. Yeah. So, in the meantime, I think we we tried to send coffee earlier. Uh, to oh, yeah, yeah. Your address. Uh, I received it. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we can start the talk at 755. Yes, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. No problem.
Um, all right. Um, so I think uh, we can start off uh, with the second talk for today. And um, thematically, uh, it's going to revolve around um, the technical needs uh, of the COVID-19 situation, uh, which is why we're having um, our Friday Hacks online uh, this semester, um, uh, instead of uh, uh, physically at U-Town as we usually do. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, let me introduce you um, our next speaker and our next talk. Um, so our next talk is going to be about um, URA, which is the Urban Area Development Authority, and their space out project, which they built last year. And our speaker is going to be Ms. Jajil Siu, who is a systems analyst um, at the Digital Planning Lab um, at URA. Her interests include software development, uh, DevOps, and uh, geospatial systems. Um, we're really excited to have URA on board uh, for Friday Hacks for the first time this semester. Um, and Ms. Jajil, um, you have the floor. Hello. Okay. So, um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank um, NUS for inviting URA to join today's sharing and um, help us uh, to share on uh, space out. So, um, a little background of myself. Um, I uh, graduated from uh, Nanyang Polytechnic, and um, I actually started. That's where I started my coding, uh, learning my coding and learning different technologies. And uh, I also specialize in geospatial and mobile where I decided to start this as my career. So, um, and then I moved on to study at SMU and uh, after which I graduated and started working in URA for about one and a half years now. Uh, and then, uh, so among my projects, is just one of them. So let me give you an, uh, outline. Uh, so I will talk about uh, how we started Space Out and some of the design concept and uh, application overview. And uh, I will end off with uh, some feedback and learning points. Uh, so the safe distancing measures was enhanced on 27 March to control uh, the mall's uh, crowd level where many malls uh, find it challenging to manage the crowd at entrances. And we also see people facing long queues when they arrive at the malls. Uh, and we do observe some malls uh, doing manual count, uh, but the information is not available to the public. So uh, that's why we started Space Out to allow people to get the latest and recent trends of the crowd levels at malls, also to enable them to make informed decisions before heading out to the mall. Uh, we hope to facilitate a more even crowd distribution uh, across the malls and ease the mall operations uh, in managing the long queues. Yeah, so, well, so we are not sure where to start. Um, so we look at the large retail malls. Uh, as we work with them, uh, we realize uh, every mall uses different technology and we also have to reach out to they are service partners for the data information that we wanted. So we managed to convince the malls that uh, the data will be uh, used for pu public use and the agency's operations, which will help us during this COVID-19 situation. So we also try our best to make it convenient for the malls to provide their data to us. Uh, we address the mall operators' concern on like what information will be stored and uh, how is it presented on space out. So we also have um, user testing with them before we launch. So after we launch, we added like new partners uh, and amenities uh, like the supermarkets, uh, post office and markets from NEA. Yeah, so, uh, so the design concept. Uh, so when we start uh, brainstorming the design of uh, Space Out, we actually wanted it to be easy to use and has to be flexible and scalable as well. So we decide on the web map application so that uh, it's easy, easily accessed with any uh, web uh, browser. Uh, users do not need to install additional application. Um, we also want the information to be available at a glance where users can easily find the crowd level information of every alert uh, from the mall, uh, from the map. Yeah. So we also make the UI components to be modular. Uh, so we are able to include more outlets and different activity types uh, progressively in a seamless way. Yeah. So we started off um, in using the traffic light color um, and using colors as the shape, uh, circles as the shape. So 
um, af but after we first launched, we do receive like a lot of feedbacks on the readability of the color uh, for the color blind. Um, it is hard for them to read. So um, we went through a few rounds of redesigning of the map, play with different color schemes, and also took advice from the experts. Um, we decided to retain the color and change the symbologies um, for each crowd level category. So in this way, we get to keep the color design that we wanted and still serve uh, the user's needs. So another feedback is that the operating hours uh, for the post office, uh, we do not want it to look too cluttered. So we actually decide to use the collapse and expand view component that we design every possible view based on the data we receive. So it could be a range of days or single day that uh, if there is extra information needed to be displayed, we have this extra label to display it. So when we work with NEA, um, we have uh, another design uh, discussion on how we want to design the queue count uh, on space up other than just the crowd level status. So we do not want to break the consistency of the design. So we added a batch label, uh, so we call it, uh, to show the queue count outside of a particular market. Yeah, so this is some of our design concept. Yeah, so we also added um, the nearby less crowded options function to give like our user a list of nearby less crowded amenities as well as like the distance away from the selected amenity. So um, apart from that, we also enable multi-language um, drop-down option to uh, be more inclusive for the members of the public. Yeah. So here are some of like the tools that we use for our UI design. Uh, we use Material UI, React components for faster and easier uh, web development. And we design our prototype in set, uh, code sandbox for easy collaboration between the UI designer as well as the engineers. Yeah. So this is our application overview. Uh, we have set up our CI-CD pipeline to review and push our codes to UAT and production. Uh, and we also have a separate data pipeline to pipe our data into our database. And, and also we have caching service in front of, uh, in the front end as well. And um, we use commercial cloud service services um, to enable us to scale up or down um, the services quickly uh, when needed. So we also separate the web app from the data pipeline so to prevent exposing the endpoints of um, the source systems. So we also actually, um, store and fuse the data we collect into the database. So to sort and mask um, the data to be displayed and uh, space out, as well as generating the trend analysis. Um, and also we adopt a various data engineering solution to um, cater to every operator needs. Uh, yeah. So next I give you a more detailed uh, um, more details in terms of our data pipeline. So we have automated scheduler to pull the data uh, and we also do uh, data processing to integrate the data and pipe the cloud documents services, which we have uh, and which we will then do further um, formatting and pipe into our database. So we have uh, the API that provided by GovTech uh, and other operators, which we will also do uh, data cleaning and formatting, then we pipe into our database. Uh, we also have bot services uh, to pipe data into our database, like Paragon Bot. Yeah. So next, um, we have um, some challenges that we face. So one of the challenges is like uh, integration of different technologies. As we receive data in like different uh, ways and format, we need to find the best solution to fit all and integrate them into one. Yeah, and the next is uh, we spend a lot of uh, time in data cleaning and formatting so that we could pipe uh, into our database programmatically. So uh, it's really quite uh, tough uh, at the start of in the earlier phase. Yeah, so we also face challenges in doing user testing as like the data 
data is time sensitive where we need to do this thing and like different timing to cover all possible uh, scenarios. Yeah. yeah, so um infrastructure security. So this is like very important when we set up our environment. Uh, we face a lot of challenges in like integrating all the services and make sure it works correctly, uh, like the configuration of the firewall, uh, the virtual network in an isolated environment, and also like data security and many more. So we also need to make sure that it doesn't go over our budget. Um, so like choosing the right resource is really important um, for us when we first set up this uh, environment. And we do work closely with our infrastructure and security team um, to ensure all the configuration are correct and the entire setup are compliance to our company policy. Yeah. So we receive a lot of um, feedback and suggestions since the launch, uh, in particular, like the visually impaired uh, individuals. So we are still trying to design our application to be more user-friendly to them. Uh, so if you guys have any ideas on like how we could do better, like do give us some suggestions on in the chat and uh, we will try to make it uh, our best to make it happen. Yeah. So here are some like of our learning points uh, from non-engineers colleagues as well. Um, we learned that like we could leverage on technology and the data to provide information for people to make informed decisions and we also able to work together to harmonize the data among the stakeholders. So we learned to create an alignment of interests with our operators and the users, uh, as well as demonstrate feasibility and value. So we also learned to prioritize user journey, so to design our application better. Uh, we design and develop upfront to do uh, improvement without disturbing like our user experience. So, uh, lastly, like we, many of us like gain a deeper appreciation of the technology use as well, uh, especially like for our non-technical colleagues. Yeah. So like, thank you for um having us today, and um do give us some of the feedback uh, on how we can improve better, and also to see you guys in our coming career fair. And, yeah. So do scan like the QR code over here. Uh, thanks, uh, Jazreel, uh, for the talk. Um, we'll move on to a Q&A session now, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, but before that, I think it'll be uh, informative for everyone if you could possibly do a demo for us uh, of Space Out uh, on your screen, just so you can walk us through all the features you have. Uh, oh, right. Okay, that? let me stop sharing. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, yep, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is how Space Out looks like. Uh, so as mentioned, this is like where we uh, integrate our translation for different um uh, and uh like race races like with like the four main uh, language that we have. Um, and also we have like some information over here in terms of the guidelines. Uh for the ESG as well as the NEA guidelines. Yeah, so, uh, um, so over here, like, as you can see, this is like much better than the, our initial um, design in terms of like just having all circles. Um, so over here with the legend, uh, we can actually uh, clearly see um, the different uh, crop level status. And uh, we actually make uh, most of the borders thicker as well compared to the very initial version so that uh, 
it's much easier for uh, people that is, are visually impaired so that at a glance they can really see um where are the like more crowded area and um as well as like less crowded area so as you click on to it um it will give you like uh, at a glance it will, it will it will give you the crowd level status as well like the more so we we choose to make the font um equal because like this is when you choose the size of the font you want to tend to let the users to land their eye on first so thus we kind of make this like larger in size um, than like the the date over timestamp over here so uh, most of the time uh, you know people were just like oh i, I just want kind of want to know what is the crowd level status and this like clearly give you the information and if you would want to know what when was it last updated then like this gives you uh, roughly the time when we last update uh, for the crowd level status for this particular mall so over here uh, we gave like a trend uh, and uh, recent trend chart that shows you like um, over the week uh, you know from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. roughly you know how crowded it is um, based on like the data that we collected so you can see like oh, over like you know Thursday at 7 p.m. is usually like more crowded so maybe you shouldn't like really go at this timing so like uh, in the early in the morning as well as like at night uh, is generally not crowded so it gives us like idea um when to go and when not to go so maybe like friday uh, morning perhaps you could uh, go at night 9 a.m you know it gives you some information insights for this and then we have these nearby options uh to show you like uh if let's say this is really crowded and then where can you uh, go alternatively like based on the distance so it gives you like um the the distance over here and then um the crowd level in color over here so you don't really have to go click into it to like oh uh this is an error but what is the crowd level status we kind of like put it here for you so uh it's convenient for the users and then we hope like this kind of gives uh, them the idea like uh, all the information they need basically in like a single map yeah so uh, over here we actually have other and mmts as well um, we, we you know include it um gradually over the months as we work with different uh, uh like different uh, agencies yeah and different stakeholders so uh, for sentosa you can like zoom all the way in over here because like it's really small so at uh, if we do not zoom in, it's really quite small for the users to like, oh, where, where is it? Like, we you know, when you click in, it will be like blank at the start if I were to, you know, um, zoom out in the original uh, map because it's really just this portion. Yeah. So that's that's why when you click into it, we will try to like, you know, zoom in for you to see. And then you can just like at a glance, you know, to know basically what is the crowd level. So for for Sentosa because they have really different types of uh, ma many different types of amenities. So we actually include the legend over here. And it's really just for Sentosa that we have like car parks, the tram stop, and the cable car. So we actually uh, work with them to come up with like the best icons, although it might be like super minor uh, like uh, icon to like most people, but I think um to enhance like user experience we really uh spend like weeks in choosing like the correct uh, icon that represent well like to uh, what really represents a tram stop and as well as like cable car uh, and a bus stop because like uh, when we have our very initial icon they tend to mix up express station and bus stop so it's really quite um uh hard at that start to like um, is the data correct or is it the icon correct? It's like uh, you tend to you know mix up um, these two and and uh, it will actually um, sort of like uh, hurt your timeline in a sense. Like if if you uh, were to like say you want to push next week and then you had this problem of 
um, maybe you mix it up, the icon, actually your data is correct, but because the icon is not correctly represented, then uh, you know, you, you just like mixed up your timeline and uh, and you have to kind of like redo and you don't really want, want that. So yeah, we, we have to keep constantly, you know, uh, work with them to ensure this is like what it is at the back end, at the end point, it's uh, correct representative of like the cable car, the express station, yeah. So we really spend like a lot of time on these layers also. Um, but but I think if as as a engineer, I think this is like what you would expect, you know, in a real um, world kind of project where you need not um you not just uh code well, you need to like uh, understand your users as well and what they really want, and then you have to work towards what they want as well as to what you have in terms of your resources, you know, stuff like this. I think um. This only you you only can could learn this like as you go on working with like industries you know and getting this experience working close with like your users sometimes you don't really get this chance of directly um, working with the users you usually have a manager to kind of um, um, be like the, the third person to like tell you what exactly it is and sometimes that tends to you know mix information up so I guess um working closely with uh, the, the users helps you to improve your design not not just like the coding like, and it's also like the design uh, as well so um i i guess when you do as an engineer you 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 might think that you might just only do parts of the development but over here we we do bits and pieces of everything so like attending to stakeholders like uh with designing with the UI, UX um, uh, designers, it gives you an insight of like how they think and whether is it possible in terms of like uh, the, the technologies that you're using. So I think this helps you along the way as you could uh, to be a better engineer yeah, in the future. Long. Yeah, so this is like my demo and right. have fun playing with it. <laughs> Right. Uh, thank you so much. It looks like a very cool application. I think it's uh, very easy to use, uh, probably because of what you spoke about, right? Um, both in, both in, insights are very important, um, how you code as well as uh, keeping uh, users in mind, especially the elderly uh, in Singapore, um, or as you mentioned earlier, colorblind uh, users. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the Q&A. Uh, so the first question is from Joshua Wong. I'll read it out loud. Uh, hello, Jazreel. How did uh, URA manage to get the data? Um, is it publicly available? I think he means the data for um, whether a user or, or for how crowded a mall is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we at the start we actually work um, with a, the large retail malls to actually convince them to, you know, uh, pass us the data, and um, we we actually convince them by um, saying that we will aggregate our uh, data, which we did at, as you see um, on the side that we have the legend that gives you a certain percentage. So like not crowded is actually less than 50%. And then some crowd is 50 to 75. So it's aggregated as uh, what the public will see, which we thought is it satisfies what we want the um, the public to know. And um, if they were to give us the raw values, we will uh, mask it, transform it, and then uh, we display it. So it gives the um, stakeholders, like the mall operators, a is sort of um, like trust that they they know that um, the data is not really um, show in the raw values. So they would then uh, come on board to, to collaborate with us uh, to at least provide some information for them to at least to know whether it's just, whether it's just crowded or not crowded. And because that's usually what um, users really just want to know. Um, and this is how we actually get the data from them. So uh but as we go along most of the malls actually um uh use safe entry because afterwards it was mandatory so most of the malls tends to switch to using safe entry so um from GovTech we actually get the aggregated data so what we do is really just uh pipe what safe entry tells us with like uh more like we try to 
monitor the data as well, whether it is accurate, and then we will work still work with the stakeholders to ensure like this is really what uh, representative of like their malls. So they are cost because they are quite concerned on like what we say on the website in terms of their court level in case like you know users will not want to go to their malls because of like what we state on our website so yeah so this is like certain consideration that we have and working with them to get the data right um just curious right uh do you all use safe entry data to uh, figure out how many people have checked into a mall uh, or is that like masked behind the GovTech api yeah so um this is what we, uh, we kind of like discuss with GovTech and and what they could give us is really uh mass based on the legend that we have because i guess like in terms of GovTech's uh site like they wouldn't really also give us like the raw values so they really just give us as like what what's satisfied which is like literally the mass uh and what we need to to display so i guess um it's only those malls that really uh, work with us uh, directly, then we will get like the raw values. If not, like uh, for safe entry data, it's all aggregated from Gafta N and they will just pipe over uh, via API and we just pipe uh, from our end. Right. Hmm. That's, that's interesting because I think mean, that's a very important principle in software engineering, right? Abstracting the um, privacy away, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, so the next question is by Jenny, uh, and she asks, um, early on you mentioned about color blindness accessibility. Um, how did your team uh, test how accessible your app is to the color blind users? So actually we, we did, um, there are some tools like out there that actually uh, has a color blindness um, color templates, like uh, basically colors that uh, is advised to use with another color. Then uh, we tried, to uh, work with all these color templates that we have. Um, and then we test it out on our website. And then we also use tools to like um, evaluate whether uh, our website is really for, um, really sort of user-friendly for the color blindness. So we do like a lot of testing with different tools to make sure our website is um, user-friendly. At least um, they get what the basic information they need. But of course, like uh, for nearby, um, facilities, they might not get as like um, at a glance, uh, you know, like the information as quickly as a normal person would, but um, at least for your first launch in, ter in terms of the map, um, of island-wide wise, you get uh, the first information um, that is what we want to achieve at the start. So this is like some of the steps that we take. And also we actually work with uh, experts that, that work with like the current binders um, individuals that, that they will actually use our website and then do a user testing with them, um, let them do, uh, let them use the, our app and then they will give us like feedback. Um, each individual will say like, you know, uh, what is lagging and, and what difficulty they have. Um, also, not just the current binders in terms of like, um, uh, those visually impacts, they, they actually can't really see, so they use a voiceover. So it's quite tough to use a voiceover on such application because what we do is really we want to see everything at a glance. So if you can't really see, it's really quite tough for us to then um, think about how we can uh, improve it um, for, for those um, visually impaired. So what we did was like, uh, if if you know like if you do inspect element you have this like aerial label, so for the voiceover how it works is to really um each of your element you must put your aerial label uh, as closely as described as like what your element is. So say if you have a search bar, your aerial element for that um element has to really um be as what you described. So when they voice over like the, the search box, it won't just say like label, it at least will say what your area label mentioned. So this is something um, I think we learned over, over this uh, project that uh, back then we didn't really think that area label actually is useful because not 
everyone will go into or you, you you don't really always hover over like the text boxes the buttons to see the label so this is something that is important for them so this is uh what we improve the app over uh all these session with uh the visually impaired individuals lah. so it's basically if if your app it's some um you, you want to develop some, your app for this um individuals then i guess you these are the things that you can consider lah. yeah right yeah that's quite comprehensive and i think um even at soc we keep in mind uh, when we're developing even our school projects that uh, we should keep our products quite accessible to um, every user regardless of who they are um i think jingen had a question so you can go ahead jingen yeah i know this earlier in the presentation you mentioned that you all use code sandbox so that you can uh, it's easier to develop between like the designers and the developers right so yeah. we have used code sandbox a little uh, but mostly for conducting workshops uh, where it's easier to have just hop onto code sandbox and then uh, tell the participants to use it so we don't have to spend time configuring their setup. Uh, we might elaborating on uh, the flow using like code sandbox because we are very interested to see how how it's done because to us it's more of a prototyping tool. Right, okay. So I think um like why why we choose that, right? It's because um um it's because our our UX guy uh like he or she may not um know coding. They basically are really good in designing. So uh for them to really tell us say um this is what they have in mind, then um having this code sandbox is re really help um us to understand like oh so this is like what you want so it it has this uh, so like what you say it's true it's a prototyping tool so because it's just so easy to use they just need to understand like you know the basics of like how how the code works they can adjust um with the template that we given to them and they, they can just adjust a part of it and then um you know, instead of like drawing, uh, oh no, this is like, I, this is the size that I want, this is like the color that I want, like, like you know, back then we use like whiteboards to like keep drawing around and we can't really visualize. So for them, they are uh, someone that would visualize things, you know, like better and explain better. So with that, like we use that protein tool to, at the same time, like uh, uh, sort of like a barrier for us, like uh, it breached the barrier. So with that, they they just need to learn a bit of the codes and then for us we just like copy and paste you know like okay so this is like the final product that you want and then, um and and most of the codes are there you just need to basically re uh, format your codes to match um to the prototype that you have so it's more like a uh, snippet of like the codes parts of the codes you know and then uh, because you don't really need the entire code you just need the parts of the codes so you can use that to as a as a uh, like what you say a prototype that we we have that to as uh, our discussion so you don't need like uh, whiteboards we, we, we don't need um other tools to, uh collaboration tools to do and because like uh, over these months we um we, we can't meet together we have to work from home so it's a platform really for us to like um you know i just send you this link this is like uh, what you need so um I guess uh, it's just how we um, do our work and how we collaborate together uh, from like between engineers and designers. So yeah, and, and because um, uh, there's this, uh, I'm not sure if you guys, heard, the Geek Lab has this storybook. So um, it works well with uh, Code Sandbox as well. So uh, they do, uh, build their storybook from there and then they can integrate like with this code sandbox to you know give basically like uh, build up something that is interactive for us to use and we can discuss over there so you know it's, it's easier for us to discuss over designs and, and whether it is technically possible because if you can produce the prototype it should be possible you know so uh, yeah I hope that answers your question so <laughs> Yeah, it's not quite something I thought of using. I guess it's also something that we on our side can explore and maybe we can use it to work with other people as well. Yeah, 
yeah, so, I thanks, guess thanks it's really, um, uh, like you have to maybe, okay, it's just for us, um, it's easier for us to collaborate. So, but I mean, uh, of course, it's not say like, uh, maybe it's not like normal way of how people will do collaboration, but, but I guess this is one way that we find it's much easier to commit convey like our ideas over this so i i, I know like other uh, project users like different tools uh, to to gel things together but you know this is just like one of uh, our way so yeah okay i think okay yeah thanks for that uh yes okay we don't have much time left uh i think there's still a question by joshua again yeah uh yeah it's the He's asking, is the safe entry data available for normal developers by us, like us? Well, okay, so safe entry is actually like given by Graphtech and um, I think, I'm not sure if they actually uh, open source their API, but from what my knowledge, I don't think they did, but um, I guess it's, you know, like to, to protect uh, data privacy, you know, issues and, and I guess um, uh, I I think this is more like what Gartec would answer better, but but I could only tell you that it's not available. But uh, if you were to see like our space out, actually most of our uh, data, like like uh, the most most of it are from safe entry. So you could actually say that like you know what the data you see here is really like from safe entry. So in a way, yeah, that's like. The closest way that you can see safe entry data, I, I presume, but but you know, um, maybe GovTech someday might might uh, give a sample of data for safe entry uh, that I not know, but but yeah, uh, that is for GovTech to <laughs> announce. <laughs> I can't really say much. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all uh we have uh for questions today. Um, and I think we can close um, today's Friday Hacks for now. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Julius and to Jazil and to U URA uh, for agreeing to give this talk. And thanks for our audience um, for showing up for um, uh, the first Friday Hack of the semester. Um, we hope that you all can give us feedback on today's Friday Hacks so that we can uh, continue to call uh, interesting speakers over um, and to explore topics um, that you want to know about. Uh, we're putting the feedback link up uh, up, up on the um, on the screen share. So please do scan the QR code and let us know um, of your feedback. Yep, uh, thank you everyone. Um, I'll give you all a minute or two to scan the QR code and we will close the meeting for today. All right, um, I hope all of you all have scanned the feedback. Um, once again, um, thank you everyone. And uh, thank you for attending uh, the first Friday Hacks of the year. See you all, see you all next to next week.